general adaptability and specific adaptability. So general adaptability is going to look at the child and the evaluation that is to go forward has to show the child's medical, developmental, scholastic, mental and emotional status and you're going to focus on the child at that point just in general. All things considered equal, would any reasonable adult be willing to adopt a child that is within this profile? Their age, their physical condition, um, and their emotional state. Are they generally adoptable? So, if we're looking at general adoptability, and we want to work a case up for a contest, okay, um, you need to do prep for that contest just like any other contest. So, one of the ways that you can kind of dig out some of the information that you may need to look at needs to include, first of all, you always want to be looking at the Title 20s, and that's going to apply to adoptability, and it also applies to the parent benefit exception. Because those Title 20s often will have more detailed information about the child, maybe about medical appointments, therapeutic appointments, um, regional center referrals, things that might trigger you that this child actually has got some problems which should be addressed before the court terminates parental rights. So um, you want to look through your file and see if there was a 730 earlier in the case, because usually we have privy to those. You know, they're supposed to be confidential, but you know, we end up seeing some of that stuff in 730s. It may start to list out some of the challenges this child might be having. Um, if the child has a therapist, there's maybe statements you can look at to see if they support the possible finding that it's not appropriate to go forward with um, adoption. We can always consider an expert on behalf of your own client. I know Leo's got expert lists. Um, but I have seen trials, and I recently saw a transcript came to me where there was a full three-day trial on an adoptability issue. Some of these other counties, they really work there. I'm telling you, it's like, I read this stuff, it's like, these attorneys are crazy. They had five experts come in to testify about the adoptability, you know. I'm just throwing it out there, you know. I don't know if you're going to get approval for the money for that kind of expert, but um, if you've got the right case, you know, you need to look at your case, and if you've got the right case, it might be something that, you know, you kind of want to fight for, is to bring an um, expert in of your own. Okay. Specifically adoptable, as if it wasn't bad enough that we have this general adoptability thing, and if we could beat it, then we would beat the termination of parental rights. Along came Sarah M. to say, well, sometimes a child who might not generally be adoptable because of their age, physical condition, mental or emotional status, they may be a child that has unique special needs, but there is specifically an, a prospective adoptive parent who has expressed a willingness to adopt that particular child. Um, so once again, we need to look at um, all those same conditions we talked about, but we want to add to it perhaps um, a couple challenges which we're going to get to, which could be um, looking at the suitability of that prospective adoptive parent, because it is appropriate under the code section to look at whether that um, prospective adoptive parent is suitable. Sometimes you see in reports where maybe they come up with a criminal hit or the prospective dad had a DUI. Those things really do need to be resolved. Um, those are things that hold up a home study and they should be resolved. Otherwise, they are arguable under the specific adaptability. I give you a citation to In Re Sarah M. It goes back to 1994, which I would like to say precedes my tenure here, but it doesn't. <laughs> I started here in 1993. Um, so here's a few more notes. I'm looking at my own notes and not moving the screen. Good. Okay. Here's a little bit of the other work and research that I've done. This is not meant to be comprehensive. These are just bullet notes of ideas that I hope maybe are helpful to you. Um, so we kind of go down, oh, what would you call it, like a laundry list of options here. Um, looking for legal impediments. These are not really very easy to find. I mean, there is a code section that says the adoptive parent has to be at least 10 years older than the child. We know that that kind of goes out of the radar screen of a lot of our clients, um, but it, there is a code section for that. Prior criminal record is probably something we see a lot more often come up. Even prospective adoptive parents sometimes have some kind of a hit. 
Um, we want to look at the length of time the child has been placed in the home. And I think there is a very viable argument to be made. Some of you may be in courts where the bench officer just simply will not terminate parental rights they, without an approved home study in place. If the home study is approved, obviously they have overcome the hurdle of the prospective adoptive parent who's got a criminal record. But some of you are in courts that have bench officers that have no problem at all terminating parental rights prior to um, an approved home study. So, if you're in one of those courts, it may be perfectly appropriate in the right case to bring up the argument that the 2-6 should not go forward because of the nature of the criminal record. How can we be sure that that is going to be able to be overcome? Um, and we always can go back to that Jason T. case, you know, how critical it is to look at the process and not have our system here at the trial level putting um, the danger of having a legal orphan. Um, I tried to kind of Google some statistics and I looked at quite a few different studies. This one that I put up here, it is aged out a little bit, um, but there's the child welfare um, study by Barry and Barth that I put on there and there is also a government office of statistics that had a couple studies. You know, if you want to get into it to this point and you really want to work up a more detailed argument on adoptability, some of the argument you could make regarding this legal orphan <laughs> issue is about failed adoptions. There's been some national studies done. Um, it is admittedly an extremely difficult argument to make when you're dealing with babies or even toddlers, you know, under three years old. Everybody's happy and joyous and they've got their baby and off they go. And, you know, it's just tough to do because the baby has not had any opportunity to manifest potential problems. They manifest, as you know, with older kids. I'm sure if any of you have been here any length of time, you have actually come across cases that are refiled with failed adoptions. I mean, they do happen. There's definitely an increase. The older the child is, we do have empirical data now to show that the older the child is, the more likelihood there is for a failed adoption. So I have some of the statistics up there. I would encourage you to please do some of your own research and citations before you start throwing all these numbers out to the court. Um, as I said, this study was even 1990. I couldn't find anything newer than that, but to come in and just say that, well, you know, we don't have failed adoptions because we have this AAP and we put services into place and they can always come to us. Um, it's nice in theory, but we really don't have a lot of um, psychological or actual studies to show that that's true. Um, some adoptions are just, are just not going to, to work. Um, I also talked early about, earlier, and that is a quote right out of the statute, the adoptive parent has to have the capability to meet the child's needs. Um, and like I said, when we see failed adoptions, we certainly see um, where sometimes that goes awry. So these are just some ideas of what can open up the door for some kind of legal argument about adoptability. I would also like to let you know that um, appellate attorneys look at this issue all the time and we write briefs on adoptability all the time and sometimes we have to work on a very tiny bit of information in the record. And so if you guys are in a spot where you've got an adoptability issue and even if, okay, you're not going to take it to a three-day long trial. Maybe you're not going to employ five experts. It's not going to go quite to that level. Um, I still wanted to point it out because sometimes even just a brief challenge on the record, Your Honor, I have reviewed you know, the XYZ report. Um, you know those sections in the report? If you're like me, that whole section in the report that talks about the child's developmental issues, educational issues, medical, don't you just set that aside let the CLC lawyers deal with that because we're really not here, you know, just gloss it over. That is exactly the spot where you're going to get most of the information you would need to make an adoptability challenge. So you might ignore that stuff maybe a little more earlier on in the case because it's just not, and it's true, it's not really the focus of where our minds are going at jurisdiction, at disposition. But those are the sections of the report. When you're at a 2-6, Take that extra minute, and this is just a flag. If this is nothing more, it's a flag to get you to look at those sections of the report. Then they attach, right, the CHDP medical forms and the dental forms, and then you've got those other forms 
I love the term they started calling it, the health and education passport. I don't even know what passport means. I have one and it's a happy thing. It means I'm going on vacation. I'm not sure what a health and education, but they attach that as an appellate attorney, right? This is the stuff we look at. This is the stuff you can take a look at. You flip through that medical thing, oh my gosh, this child is autistic. This child has had this problem in school. The teachers can't keep him in his chair, whatever. You know the stuff that we read. Those are the documents. The ones that you skip over in the beginning of the case are the ones that you need to just take a look at at the 2-6 hearing. So, anybody have any questions about adoptability? Um, Otherwise, we're going to go to the other loser issue that we have. <laughs> I want to tell you that I had a wonderful opportunity to actually speak with, and I brought the paper with me, um, one of the attorneys who was on the committee, the, the Senate Bill 243 committee back in 1988, well-intentioned and horrified she was to now see the way this parental benefit exception has actually been applied. The ones that sat on the committee um, that first did, this was the big major, major over, overhaul of the whole 366.26 system um, back in 1988. And they came up with this parental <coughs> benefit exception and what they said was there is substantial clinical evidence to show that some children in foster care retain very strong ties to their biological parents. Amazing. Um, termination should not be considered if it's not desired by everybody in the family. Um, so that is language taken directly out of the SB 243 committee meetings. And it was their intention on that committee that there would be a viable argument to be made in certain circumstances that because that um, child has such a close tie, that parental rights should not be terminated. I talked to her and she, I mean, for all these years, she just still scratches her head and wonders why isn't guardianship good enough? Especially the, some of the kids that are a little bit older. It's still physical custody till they're 18. The guardian <coughs> still has all the rights to make decisions, right? You hear the questions they ask in court, you know the script by now probably, the medical, dental, educational, um, decisions for the child. Um, why the freight train all the time to adoption? So I just kind of wanted to bring that up and say, you know, this was the legislative history. What the courts have done with it um, is practically removed it <laughs> as a viable argument. They keep putting one hurdle after the other after the other. So I'm just here to kind of say, let's not just give up the ship on this. You know, let's look at what the statute says. I couldn't put all the key citations on here where the parental benefit exception was a loser issue because I didn't have enough screens and pages to go through. There's so many of them. What I did on the last page of your handout is list out about six cases where it worked. And I thought maybe that would be a little bit more valuable for you to see. Actually, I think it's the last two pages of your handout um, shows the circumstances where the parental benefit exception was applied um, and where it was, well, was either applied and affirmed or whether what wasn't applied and they got a reversal. In other words, it was something that worked for the parents in that case. So, <coughs> we all were around a couple years ago when they renumbered it. And, I missed my, there it is. So they added all these subdivisions, so I still don't know really how they're saying this in court. Do they say C1B1, C1B, little I? Or, you know, or do they just call it the benefit exception? Yeah, they call it the benefit exception. Yeah, it's the relationship exception. I don't know. It's all really too wordy for me, but I haven't figured out how to fix it. That's probably why I don't work at the AOC. Anyway, um, under the circ these circumstances, this is the way the statute reads. The court shall terminate parental rights unless either of the following applies. First, you have to look at whether or not it would be actually detri detrimental to the child, okay, due to one or more of the following circumstances. And then it lists out, I think it's six of them now. Um, I look at the writ attorneys, isn't it six? I think there are six exceptions now, um, which we're not going to. The sibling exception, there's an Indian child welfare exception. The parental um, beneficial relationship exception falls under this category. 
First, you must show that the parent has had regular visitation. It's just the first hurdle you have to cross. You're not going to be able to make a viable argument if you do have a parent that has absolutely and completely disappeared. Um, there is a case cited where um, the parental benefit exception was upheld in Ray Brandon C. I have cited where the parent had only had monitored visits all the way up to the 2-6 hearing. So it's not true to say that the parents have to have progressed all the way to unmonitored visitation in order to show that they've maintained regular visitation. Even if it's still monitored, as long as they're regularly showing up, that's really about all you need to overcome that first kind of prong um, of the regular visitation requirement. Um, the child would benefit from continu continuing the relationship. That benefit, that word benefit, is obviously a very broad and a very gray area, and it's made for a lot of arguments. So not only are you guys doing it at the trial level, but the appellate attorneys are writing this issue like crazy. So there's kind of been an evolution. You know, they wrote it for several years and wrote it, and it was just a loser, and it was a loser, and it was a loser. Um, and then along came the case of In Re S. Which was in 2008. And the court found that the trial court should have applied the benefit, um, this exception in that case. The record shows this was a daughter, and the, um, it was a father who was challenging the termination of his parental rights. I believe in this case the child was with a paternal grandmother. So they kind of had an intact family unit, so it had pretty good facts going on. Um, and the court said it was clear from the record that the child was derived some measure of benefit from his visits. Now, the reason this was kind of revolutionary when Ingray SB came out, because up until that point in time, the major case that we had was Autumn H. I think most of you are probably familiar. If you're not familiar with the name of the case, you're familiar of this balancing test the court always does where the benefit of being adopted into a permanent home outweighs whatever potential little benefit they might have from maintaining parental ties and contact. So on Autumn H, it just seems like when that was all we had, it's just you're going to lose every time because there is this kind of... Um, feeling and mentality from the bench that all things considered, we're going to opt for the permanent adoptive home as a better choice. If you're just going to balance between the two, at a 2-6 hearing, the parents are probably going to lose out every single time. So here comes NRA SB, and oh my goodness, everybody lights up some measure of benefit. And if we can use that language, right, now we've really got something we can argue at the trial level, because can't you always find something? measure of value your mother for God's sake you know something that you can argue so the appellate attorneys started writing this and writing this and writing this and appeal after appeal after appeal went in and they were we were always quoting I should say they I wasn't doing it then but SB was always being quoted and arguing that there was some measure of benefit so um, this is out of uh, the fourth district San Diego I do believe and uh, Jason J came out and said Gee whiz, you know, the italicized portion of that language in this recipe has really been causing us a lot of problems because attorneys are arguing it all the time. It's been problematic. We don't know what to do. They put all this kind of cautionary language in there, but they didn't really say it until we got to in Ray CF. Just came out, I thought it was last year, I see 2011. Okay, earlier this year it came out, and the Court of Appeal just went nuts. They just said, this we don't want you arguing this anymore unless your facts are exactly identical to the facts of NRA SB. Talk about a chilling effect, right? It's a published decision. It says, do not argue this anymore. It's really not what we really meant, okay? So, I mean, really, look at the case. I swear to God, exactly. Do not argue some measure of benefit. You know, we just said that in that particular situation. So please don't do that anymore. So, you know, I sat at an appellate attorney training with everybody kind of scratching their head, you know, and of course, um, the appellate attorneys just sort of, you know, their little backs just reared right off, like we're not just gonna give up on this just because this court of appeal is kind of all over the place. We're gonna go back to basics. And that's what I'm here to say. Okay, 
we probably can't make a viable you know, argument under this section of some measure of benefit. But we can still go back to the basics, right, of um, the 2-6 exception as it stands. I'm on the right page. Parent bears burden of proof. Okay. First of all, you know that the parent bears the burden of proof to show that the exception should be applied rather than ignored. So you have the burden of proof and you've got to get your case ready. Um, the department has the burden of proof on the adoptability issue. The parent bears the burden of proof of, of any of those six exceptions, this one included. Um, must show regular contact, but I put a case citation up there. Do, do most of you still hear county council saying that the parent needs to, have, to stand in the shoes of the parent um, in order to have this benefit applied? That was an argument that I used to hear a lot, and there was a Jasmine, one of the dozen Jasmine cases did say something like that, but this is after that. Um, KCD said it doesn't have to be day-to-day -day contact. That's really not what's required. It's more the nature and the quality of the conduct that the contact that the parent has with the child. So we don't really want to um, allow county councils to just have that argument be persuasive at the trial level that the parent needs to be fulfilling a parental role and be standing in the shoes of the parent. Um, no. KCD is the case you want to have if you're countering that argument. The beneficial relationship in the end is really about facts, facts, and more facts. We've got to dig out the facts of the case to really be able to make um, a well-rounded argument about the relationship that these parents and children have. Um, I'm going to sit down, I just decided. Um, I had a case recently that I thought was kind of interesting when I, I was, I'm always reflecting back on all the years that I spent over here fighting the good fight. Um, and I lost my train of thought when I started thinking about being back here. Um, anyway, about the facts of the case and how we have to look at the facts and facts and dig in. Um, the portion of the child's life spent in the parent's custody, um, there are some of the cases that I cited later on do talk about um, how long did the parent actually raise their own child. It's going to be information that tends to um, work towards the parent benefit exception because we're going to show, first of all, we started off at some point in time with a, with a good and close and bonded relationship because the parents were raising this child. Obviously, these are tougher arguments to make when a, a child is detained at birth. Um, oh, I started talking about this case that I came across. That's where I wanted to go. Um, and it was interesting to me, the visitation logs or the portion of a social worker's report, sometimes I give just a little one paragraph, paragraph synopsis. The parent visited on such and such a day. The visit went without negative incident. Or um, the, just they just have these little one-sentence blurbs that they put in. Well, there are some other... Um, agencies, particularly in Orange County, um, that have developed very extensive visitation logs. And they have monitors that write down, literally in five and six minute increments, exactly what's going on in the visit. Who said what, what toy they played with, what snack they brought, expressions of affection between the parent and the child. And you don't always get that when you have a relative monitoring <coughs> Now, I'm not here to say that having a relative monitor is a bad thing. All I'm pointing out is the potential that there is a difference. So the benefit of having a relative monitor a parent's visits are many. Scheduling is probably one of the biggest. Access to the child is probably the second biggest. We know that when we have a relative who's willing to monitor, the parent's going to get a lot more time with the child. But in this particular case, for the first year, um, one of the relatives that had the child was monitoring the visits. And that was what we got, was a little one sentence. You know, the, the caretaker says the mother visits and the visits go, are, go well or they go fine. <clears throat> well, a little bit of a negative thing happened. The child was moved and the circumstances dictated such that the new person taking over the child's care didn't want to monitor the visits anymore. So they started being conducted at the agency with these, um, they have professional monitors that supervise. 
And suddenly in the record at the 2-6 hearing, I had 47 pages of single space typed. Okay, I'm giving you an extreme example just to make the point. 47 <coughs> pages of single type about every single contact that, I mean, it changed the whole tone of the record that was being read. It went from, you know, this kind of mother with some mental health problems that didn't look too good on paper. It was like a drug and mental health case. On every single visit, this particular monitor just went on and on and on about all these expressions of love. The detail, yes, yeah, some of it got repetitive after a while, but it was for months and months and months. And so I just kind of wanted to highlight that as something um, that you might want to consider. And I had another handout, and I swear this is just something. Do you have it, Steve? The visitation log one? Um, I stole this, sort of plagiarized it out of Orange County um, for no other purpose than to give you a little bit of an idea. If you have a client that's visiting their child and you have a parent or a family friend, I mean, outside of an agency visitation, you can steal this, you could modify it. You guys all have social workers, I know that, I don't know if they're, are they, Tim, like monitoring visits sometimes or observing visits and reporting back. But imagine the difference if you went into a parental benefit exception contest and you had 40 or 50 of these dated from every visit, signed off by the visitation monitor, just throwing it out there as a trial tool, you know, that had this kind of detail, and this isn't even the detail that was in that Orange County case. I just took some of the, this is just some, a sampling of the language. Oh, did you have that? <coughs> oh, does, does everybody know what I'm talking about here? Yeah, yeah. You do have a lot, okay. Um, some of the language that you could put in, and I think that this would really be a potential tool. When I read this record, I felt like, this went from being a case that would have had to be sought AC, you know, just a, an appeal that probably would have to be abandoned as no merit to something that was actually something that, that we could write a brief and we could argue. So, I mean, you're not here to make the case for appeal. You're here to persuade your own trial judge. But I'm just kind of giving you the perspective from the other end. If, even if you're unsuccessful, that parent, when they have their parental rights terminated, they march right down to the second floor and file their appeal, you know that. And then, you know, you're kind of handing the case off to somebody who can do something. So I just kind of throw this out there as something you might want to consider giving um, when you're just, you're not going to have these human, what do they call them, human services aides now they have in L.A. County that are monitoring visits. I, I still think with most of them, you're not getting very much detail. Excuse me. Yeah. Could we ask at detention that um, for the benefit of the court, in assessing mother's contact with the child that wants to be kept in intervals for all, all contacts, whether it's monitored phone contact, if we, as long as there's a monitor, why can't we know what happened to that? And the court order it. I, I don't know why you couldn't. I mean, really, it's up to the bench to make a decision. I could see Jackie Lewis going for something like that because she likes more information, more and more, and some of the courts might not. Mm -hmm. could be something that would be good. You know, before, I think sometimes we would dig some of this kind of information out of the Title 20s, but it's not always, those Title 20s are kept by the social workers. You know, and they're not always the one monitoring the visits anymore since they hired these human service aides. So, sure, any time that you can kind of draw the court's attention to the fact that, you know, it would be beneficial to have more information <coughs> rather than less about the nature and quality of the visitation. Of course, it could work against <laughs> Indeed, indeed. I mean, not every visitation law, you know, sometimes they say, you know, horrible things, but, I mean, that's the nature of the work that we do down here, right? Um, anyway, so we talked about facts, facts, facts. We're trying to bolster, kind of bolster the case up. Um, Informal discovery is still perfectly appropriate, in my opinion, to prepare for a 2-6. I don't think you should ever go into a contested 2-6 without the Title 20s. I mean, that's probably pretty much um, a regular thing that you guys would ask for. Um, you can still ask for visitation logs and notes because I do believe, um, and you guys can get me up to speed and tell me if I'm wrong, but I do believe that there are still some agencies um, that monitor visits, like Vista Del Mar or the Westside Children's Center, you know, some of these agencies 
they monitor visits and they keep, trust me, they're keeping logs. They're putting, at least they have a check the box forms. Um, and we don't always ask for those. Maybe we need to subpoena them or if the social worker has taken those copies, they have it in their file. Um, you know, even aside from this little handout that I gave you, I'm not looking to put more burden or work on you guys. You know, you should first look and see if the case has visitation logs anywhere on its own and it's something that is discoverable and you can bring in and read. Um, you can look to see if there's any kind of bonding or other psychological study in the file. Often those studies are done um, and they have information about the parent-child relationship in them. Um, I wanted to bring up uh, the CASA. Shall we talk about CASA for a minute? Um, because I thought it was an interesting fact to note. Is this the in No. No. Uh, Scott. I went the wrong way, probably. In Ray Scott B, um, we're into this list of cases where the bene the benefit was shown, and it was uh, this would be cases that would be um, successful for the parent. In that case, there was a CASA report, right? And what does it say on the face of the CASA report? The CASA supports the department's position that parental rights should be terminated and supports adoption as a permanent plan. So if you just take a look at that report, you go, okay, CASA, we know, you know, they're joining the department. But in the body of this report, it went on to say, gee whiz, this would be a disaster, really, if the child could not have ongoing contact with the biological mother. Now, the CASA aren't necessarily going to be people that would see the inconsistency of a statement like that, because in a legal context where we're coming from, we would see that that's also true. You can't have that position, even though to this CASA, I'm sure it was very practical. Like, yes, adoption would be great, but really, you know, we want the child to still be able to see the parent. When as lawyers, we know that there's no legal way that we can protect that relationship if parental rights are terminated. So the Court of Appeal pointed that out, and I thought it was interesting to note that sometimes we need to maybe dig a little deeper. There was just like a little tiny gold mine in this when saying, the CASA might have agreed with it on the face, but from a practical application, they are also taking a position that this parent-child relationship should not be severed. So that's um, what I wanted to point out, out about In Ray Scott B. It was kind of a unique case, too, in that the, the opinion went on for just pages and pages and pages about um, the special autistic needs of this child and how it was. Donna, it was your case? case yeah, I see you nodding. I remember that. Okay. Yeah. So they went on and on. They made quite a record with, you know, how badly this child melted down when the mother, you know, would leave a visit. And anyway, there was just a lot of information in it. But admittedly, this was, you know, unique in in that um, in and of itself that it had um, a very a special needs kind of a and high, the boy high needs child. Too, and he basically said, okay, you can adopt, but I want to see my mother all the time. <coughs> Also, right. Interesting, though, that the courts, the trial still court, still terminates. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just saying, the, the appellate attorney sometimes, you know, these cases can be turned around on appeal, and that was a good example. Um, in Ray CB, I'll just alert you to, um, as we're looking at what facts, what facts, what facts can I argue? Well, this, the minors were aged nine and ten, um, and the caretaker indicated that she would allow the children to have ongoing contact with the parents. Now, that always used to frustrate the heck out of me when I was in trial court, because it's like the feel-good thing to say. You know, like, oh, this isn't really going to be as painful and as horrible. You know, court, really, to the judge, don't feel the pain. You can go ahead and terminate parental rights. It's really good to somehow all be OK. And that used to just drive me crazy, you know, because I knew that there's no enforceable way. Yes, Marlene? No, no, no. Oh, OK. To, um, and, you know, we can't enforce a visitation order, so, you know, if it all blows up, there's no protection for the parent. Well, in this case, the court had gone, the trial court had gone through and made every single proper finding on the record where they go through about, you know, the contact and the weighing thing with the automage and the benefit of adoption, had made all this great record, but also as one of the line items had said, also took into consideration that the caretaker is going to let the parent have ongoing contact and the Court of Appeal reversed. They pulled that one sentence out of all those findings, which really looked to be proper findings, which would support the termination of parental rights. 
and reversed the case and said the court, we can't be sure the court didn't employ an improper standard and highlighted the fact that a court cannot take that factor into consideration <coughs> under 2-6 in making a decision to terminate parental rights. They'll talk about it all they want and how happy they're all going to be and live happily ever after, but it's not going to fly because now you have in rate CB to say that that is uh, not appropriate. Now you may talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for everything. This is a welcome presentation. Um, I just want to, in relationship to that, add, I think we need to look at 366-26-H, which dovetails with, with this issue, because in our first months as Ladle, when I was still fresh out of minor counts, minor's counsel representation, I was on a case where the there, it looked as if there was no basis for me to stop at that point the termination of parental rights. So what I did is I argued 366-26-H, which says, one issue as to whether the children are present, whether they can have the hearing in chambers, but whether they're here or not, minor's counsel has to go on the record and the court has to make findings that the termination of parental rights, this is separate from the beneficial issue, the, the court has to make, in the language of the statute, is shall, the court shall find that it's in the best interest and, not or, and, the court must find that you know it's in, that it's it reflects. They have to show that it reflects the wishes of the child. Many times when the kids aren't brought in, what gets buried are what the children's wishes are, especially when you have nine and ten year olds whose minors counsel may not have told them what does it mean to really be adopted. In other words, your caretaker may tell you today that you're going to see mommy and daddy. But you know what? She moves to New York, you're never going to see him again. In a child-friendly way, minors counsel has an obligation to explain that to older children, 9, 10 year olds And if they don't do that, the court cannot terminate parental rights. The reason why I'm raising this is, is when I filed the appeal, I got a call from Stephanie Miller, which shocked the hell out of me, who said, I got to tell you, we're not going to win on this one, but push the issue because there is a defense embedded in 366-26-H, which means that the court has to, I mean, minor's counsel has to be able to go on the record and say, say I, this is age appropriate, you know, these are 9, 10, 11 year olds, okay, once they get 12, it's their veto power, but those middle range children, minor's counsel has to say in an age appropriate way, I've discussed what adoption means, okay? And this is my client's wishes. If they can't say that, and he gets blurred with that case, I think we have an independent <coughs> defense of the 366-26H. Yes. You know what, I would just, that's very good, and I would just add to that um, the fact that sometimes there are bench officers, when you ask to have a child testify at a 26, they will refuse to let you have the child testify. And they do that because there was a case that came down quite a few years ago which said, you know, that there was this discretion of the court if it's going to traumatize the child and all that at a 2-6 or even at a 2-2. I'd have to look at the case again to see exactly in that case what hearing it was at. But would, would let the, you know, not have the child, would deny your request to have the child testify. And I think that's a really good code section that you could use to say if there's any gray area at all, you know, the court has an independent authority, you know, duty, and I think you can use that code section to argue against, because I had that several times, even Judge Stevens, who I like very much, denied me one time when I asked to put a child on the stand on a, on a 2-6, so I think it's a good, so I'm just, you know, adding that to the mix. you got to get the child in chambers or up on the stand and be able to take them. You ask the court to uh, question the minor's attorney, have you discussed, you know, the age section? What I do. I mean, but I think we can't put you up on the No, you, 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 first of all, very few people know about 366-26-H. So the truth is, once you quote it, the judges are going to pick up the book and read it because they've probably never looked at it. Right. And you have to show them the shall language. And you have to say, at this point, Your Honor, you can't terminate parental rights because I would like, and what I did in this case, and why Stephanie sort of liked it, is I said, Your Honor, I think, you know, minors, either the kid is here so that I can question the child, or 
Miners' counsel has to give some kind of offer of proof. I'm going to object to an offer of proof, but I need to know how she questioned this child because if the child doesn't know what adoption means and the child just thinks caretaker will allow some kind of visits, that's completely separate events we can develop. But what if you don't say anything, they put on their case, and they haven't addressed it, and then in your closing argument, you say, Your Honor, there's been no evidence whatsoever that 366.268 has been addressed. I, therefore, you <coughs> cannot, and don't give them the authority <coughs> to reopen. I mean, they have to put their case on. They don't say anything. They don't know about age. We throw it in their face. I mean, they'll know later on, but maybe not for that. <laughs> I don't know at that point if we waive it or not. This, I'm just telling you, I don't, this is, something that I tried because I didn't have anything else or it worked at least to some extent so I could open my mouth. Stephanie Miller came back and said for appellate purposes it didn't work because there really wasn't anything there. But she said, please think out of the box. Explore this area. Look at it. Yeah, Hang on, Jess, Jasmine or Heather and then train you. It's actually Ryan. Okay. So does the this H subsection does it have a specific exception for when the kid's like pre-verbal and they couldn't possibly explain any of that stuff to a kid? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. I think we sort of know that we have a much harder, harder time on the pre-verbal, on babies and toddlers, but yeah, I don't have the book here to look at the exact wording, but we all know that the Minors Council still has a duty to represent, you know, the best interest of the child in court, so they've still got to, you know, they, they have that duty anyway. Strength? Yeah, I mean, if you can get the child up on the stand, that's, yeah, exactly, good, thank you for letting us know that. Um, anybody else? The last couple of cases here before we wrap it up, um, just some additional case citations with just a little blurb. Um, this is a different in rate. Is it different? No, wait a second. There were several SB cases. I forget now. I think maybe this was the same one. Anyway, don't, this is another one that supports that you don't have to show day-to-day -day care of, of the child. Um, there was also arguments for, for a while coming through the cases that, you know, this is where the stand in the shoes thing came from. You do not need to show that the child's primary attachment is to the parent. Um, in Ray Jerome D. was a 16-year-old mother. Several years later, um, the child went to the stepfather. They actually had other children together, but the one that was at issue here, um, well, I just put this one in for entertainment value, because in the opinion, the court criticized the social worker, sorry, just had to share that, um, <laughs> for criticizing the mother's trivial matters and tending to overlook the caretaker's deficiencies. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that kind of thing happen before. I have. <laughs> Anyway, um, in this particular case, it was reversed both on the adoptability findings and the beneficial relationship exception. So um, it's just one, like I said, if you think you might have facts that fit, you can always look up this case and look into it more in depth. Um, Brandon C. is a little bit of an older case in 1999. This was out of, does anybody remember Brian Petrovorg? <laughs> Some of the old ones. Oh, yeah. Brian Petrovorg was very willing <laughs> to... Um, let's just say, a very parent-friendly courtroom for the most part. Anyway, um, he found the exception applied and the county appealed out of his court. Um, this was one where the parents had kept regular monitored visits for over two years. Um, and in this one, is this the one I think the care, yeah, the caretaker was the grandmother, right? You think, you know, we we'll get her in our corner and she'll say she wants guardianship. No, she actually testified that she would really prefer adoption. Um, but if it went guardianship, she'd be okay with that. You know, usually we see it the other way around. Anyway, in that case, the court found the exception applied, um, granted a guardianship, the county appealed, and they lost. So I still put this in the win column for the parents, even though it went up the other way around. So that's the Brandon C. case. Um, I think it's a very good one to quote, especially when you've got a grandparent caretaker, which we have a lot of those. Um, we have a little bit of time, but I don't really think we should go back to those first topics because I'll probably get in a lot of trouble for joking around too much. But anyway, um, anybody else have any other questions? 
There we go. Otherwise, we're going to enjoy a little bit of today. Can you just put your trash in the trash receptacle?